My name is Yuval Schreiber, and I'm the founder and the CEO of Tel Aviv University uh, Online, and we are a co-founder of this conference. And Tau Online has been helping to shape and design Tel Aviv University vision for the last four or five years. Um, so um, this panel is going to be a little bit strange. We are not going to go through a very long round of introduction. Instead, I'm going to try and uh, ask each panelist here uh, a question, and hopefully we'll learn something new about them because you've all seen them uh, a few times before in panelists, so I hope to uh, surprise them with a difficult question and, and see how they can deal with it. Um, so the first panelist that I want to ask a question is uh, Mr. Ben Nelson. Um, first of all, thank you really for uh, coming to this uh, summit and to this conference. Ben's father has been a distinguished uh, professor in our university, uh, and we love him very much. And uh, Ben, um, you are the, I would just say that, the founder and CEO of the Minerva Project, a reinvented a university experience for the world most motivated student, and I know that because you take all our students to your university. Um, so, um, dear Ben, what exactly is the problem that Minerva is trying to solve, and how? That's, uh, that's a long question, but um, <laughs> e easiest way to understand this is w when you think of a lot of startups, uh, but especially in the education technology world, um, what they're trying to do is something that most successful startups don't do. So easy way to think about it is, use, uh, is think of Uber. You all know Uber, DD, Get Taxi. So imagine that you were to say, um, I want to build a, a way to do better ride hailing. So I've got a great idea. I'm going to build an app on the phone that makes the phone glow really brightly so when I wave it, the taxi will stop, right? That would be an approach to look at the existing way of doing things and trying to make it a little bit better. That company would be valued at zero dollars and zero cents. It's worthless because, yeah, it improves incrementally, but then somebody would think a little bit differently and say, you know, the whole high hailing of cab experience is a really bad experience. And so what can technology do to change fundamentally the process of getting from point A to point B using an automobile that you aren't driving? Right? And that's what led to a very series of successful companies, not just Uber, not just DD, but Lyft, uh, Go, Get, etc. So our approach is uh, similar. So rather than saying, oh, Let's, you know, we, we hear people bemoan, oh, you know, universities are not going to be the same in the future. They're doing the same thing. But I've got a great idea. Let's take the least effective format of education, which is the lecture, which, has, which shows 90% failure rate within six months after finishing. I've got a great idea. Let's do that and then put it online and give it to more people. Right? This is not necessarily the smartest way of using technology. And so what, what we have done is go back to first principles and say, what kind of education would make the most sense and forget limitations, forget what is possible, what's being done, but how does the mind actually work? How does it retain information? How does it able to translate information and basic ideas from one context to another? And then, what is it that we need to build in order to enable it? And that's what we've built. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's a great, very good uh, answer to what you're doing at, over there at Minerva. Thank you. Um, so our uh, next panelist is uh, Sean Abson. is uh, the chief design officer at the Edplus Center at the Arizona State University. We heard, all heard your beautiful presentation. So thank you again for coming from the desert of uh, Arizona to the desert of uh, Israel. Um, I've been going, and I know uh, some of you have been going to the ASU GSV conference uh, every year. We're a group. We urge you to come with us again every year in April. And actually, this summit, the ASU GSV, has been an inspiration for uh, 
uh, this summit. We hope to be the TAU and uh, uh, our partners at the Istuin and Yaki as the GSV. So um, the Arizona State uh, your University, Arizona State University, is be really known to make uh, to be great in what you're doing uh, in in terms of changing um, teaching and learning in your university. So what is it exactly your secret sauce? What do you do differently? Can you help us and other universities to make that change? Sure, so, so thanks again for, for the invitation and for being here. Uh, so, so we get this, this question quite a bit and if you were to ask uh, 50 people at the university, you might get uh, quite a few different answers. From my perspective, and I alluded to, to this uh, previously in, in, in the discussion, it's, it's twofold. Uh, once we've had a, a very strong vision uh, that we've consistently stuck to for the last 15 years, uh, the byproduct of that is a culture that embraces change. Uh, so when uh, a new opportunity arises, digital education, a new partnership. Uh, there is a culture that understands that we need to change, uh, to adopt to and adapt to whatever it is that opportunity might be. And so when you have an institution of, of our scale and you have the student body we have, the diversity we have amongst our faculty and our students um, and the experiences that you go through and there's stresses to the institution every time you pick a, a new project and you've changed the academic calendar to support a, a, an online student, for example, that is a huge culture change for an institution. When you have a single faculty body that is serving 38,000 digital students and, and 72,000 residential students at the same time, same faculty, same degree, that is a huge cultural change that goes into that effort. Over time, as new people come, they are uh, acculturated to the university as people leave. Uh, and, and, and so I, I would say the secret sauce is that we have a culture around urgency that is in alignment fundamentally with the mission that I, I put up on the slide earlier. Wow, beautiful. Um, okay. Um, our next, next guest is Professor Colitis from the University of uh, Nicosia. Um, he's, uh, Professor Colitis is the Vice President of the University. He has an extensive academic and research experience in the field of education policy. So, prof dear Professor, thank you for coming all the way from our uh, neighbor island. And, uh, it's not far away. It's not far away. Uh, and could you please share? Uh, what is the University of Nicosia vision of higher education and what is Cyper, uh, uh, Cyprus uh, vision for uh, its uh, universities? Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, I'm indeed very glad that I am here and I have the chance to speak with you. So, <clears throat> the University of Nicosia, uh, you asked me what is the vision of the university. The vision of the university is to offer, we try to, to offer new mod, a new model of education. We heard uh, previously some uh, inspiring talks about the changing of uh, the educational landscape and the, the role of universities and the role of teachers and the role of students. And uh, indeed, uh, we have all uh, realized that uh, we are in a period where everything changes very rapidly. We have acquired massive amount of data. Educational research has given us massive amount of data as how students learn, how teachers should teach, what is the role of technology and so on. What uh, we have failed to do, and, uh, I mean collectively, we have failed to do is to transform this uh, sort of data into effective practices. So we need uh, uh, to change the role of the university 
and add, uh, I'm referring to the first uh, speaker, to add uh, some new dimensions in the mission of the universities. The universities should break the walls between them and society, and uh, speaking of education, especially between them and schools. Uh, technology is uh, not uh, is not a panacea. Uh, you cannot solve problems with technology, but technology could be used as a tool to uh, help us to overcome problems. And uh, one of the problems that we are now facing is the task of transforming the vast amount of data available into effective teaching practices. This is what we are trying to, to do. Part of our mission is uh, in the university and our research is uh, to find uh, technologies that could, could help us to transform this, amount, this short, big amount of data into effective practices. And there are available technologies. Uh, for instance, block te blockchain technologies could help us to reverse uh, the, uh, usual, the usual interplay between teachers and uh, students. Now we try to see what I'm giving a, a, an example. I'm, uh, we try to, <coughs> to find what sort of mistakes or errors uh, a student may, usually makes. If we go, if we reverse this uh, procedure, because we now have all the mistakes, we have recorded that we have, we know all the mistakes that students usually make, and we know all the cognitive obstacles that students face in order to overcome these mistakes. So if we reverse the process and we try to make the student aware of the mistakes that he or she usually makes, and uh, the teacher to become aware of the cognitive obstacles that a student faces, then we could uh, transform the teaching process uh, quite dramatically. So uh, if uh, okay. we could amount, uh, had this big amount of data in a secure and transparent way, we have got uh, a good uh, chance of making a, change. making a change, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, our last panelist uh, is Mr. Uh, Eran Raviv, the director of Campus IL, Israel National Pro Platform for Digital Learning based on open edX technology. Dear Eran. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming all the way 10 minutes from here. <laughs> um, so my question to you is, um, could you please tell us why Israel needs a national platform? Uh, okay. So thanks uh, firstly for inviting us. Um, I'll start with sharing an anecdote. So Yuval and myself took the same uh, introduction to political science 20 years ago in the Hebrew University. Uh, we were the same class. And this semester was all about why do we need a state? There are different answers to the, the, this question, different approaches, and you can see it uh, all around the world that there are different countries. But the thing that is in common with all theories is that it's a kind of a union that starts with giving civilians the necessary means for survival. Water, bridges, parks, protection. And then there are some countries that take it to a very minimal level of survival. And there are some countries uh, like welfare countries that takes it to a, a broader interpretation. Um, relating to the panels in the last two days, speaking of 2030, many people losing their jobs and need to adjust themselves, we believe that education and access to knowledge is a, a very important part of securing your well-being as, as a citizen. And that's the, the logic behind establishing a national platform. Um, we're launching soon, by the end of this year, with uh, around 180 courses, training um, in different fields, vocational, employment, 
uh, higher education, and we believe that um, giving this access to education, knowledge, skill set is part of the uh, country's responsibility. And uh, I invite you all uh, to hear more about the Campus IL initiative. Uh, we're going to have a Zoom in session, one o'clock, the Einstein Hall, to elaborate uh, on what we do. Thank you so much, Aran. And thank you all the panelists. So, I promise you it's going to be the best panel of this conference, or we're going to do something that has, has never been done before in any panel. We're going to allow you to ask questions. Uh, it's very uh, strange uh, uh, paradigm. So, if anyone has a question to our dear panelists, uh, please come here. I'll give him a microphone and he can ask a question, but be very brief. Not one of those questions where you present yourself for like, 10 minutes and then we run out of time and no time for answer. So does anyone have a question? You have a question. Let's try. Iran helped me to translate. ומילה עלייך, מי את? פורום לשוויון הזדמנויות בחינוך. אוקיי. So, uh, can you help me translate the question? So, I think, like, if I understood you right, so the question was, how can you leverage big data for the public good? How to leverage big data for the public good? How to, um... Who, whoever wants to take on that it's a great question. Feel free. I, I can share one example. of uh, So Campus AL is part of Digital Israel initiative in the Ministry of Social Equality. And one of the big projects uh, Digital Israel leads is uh, digital health. So imagine having everyone's records, medical records, anonymized. We don't know anything about you personally, but we do know something about the pattern of the flu. We know that uh, on the second week of November, there's going to be lots of people with, with the flu. So the Ministry of Health can use this big data in order to vaccine population and um, distribute the vaccine in a, a mean that will be mostly effective. That's just um, it's a, it's a small great, example. It's a great example, and I think we're all being surrounded by these words, big data and AI, and <laughs> we keep hearing them, and also blockchain. So uh, do we have another question, a specific question to one of our panelists? Yes, you can come here and uh, ask the question. Yeah, come. We're not scary. I'm not. Iran is. <laughs> Who are you? Hi, I'm Willa Perlman. I'm from the United States. I'm a sponsor and speaker here. And my question is, um, do, for all of you actually, um, do you envision uh, higher ed using predictive data, particularly with respect to the job market trends, in a nimble fashion, in a continuous fashion, to inform students and help students uh, think about what they want to study in, 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 in um, concert with what jobs they can expect to get. You know, we grew up in a world of liberal arts education without that sort of uh, targeted uh, education, unless you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer. But, uh, we now have so much data, predictive data, that it would seem to me that universities could actually be far more effective in helping students maximize their, the cost of their education by targeting them and helping them figure out how to be gainfully employed when they graduate. Thank you so much for a wonderful question. 
Iran, I, answer the last question, so. I, I can give a, a little bit of insight into this. So the, one of the main problems with looking at current market data to inform programs, um, which in many ways universities have been doing in a small way, is that by the time the data comes in, the course design occurs, the degree gets approved and changed, offered, students take it, graduate, the data is useless. And the problem is that the cycle time is huge for universities to actually use that data and adapt to it. So just think about it, look at it from computer science, right? If I were to, uh, or programming, something very vocational and, uh, and straightforward. If I were to uh, take a pulse 10 years ago of what it is that Silicon Valley employers would re are really desperate for, um, they would say, oh my God, we have this incredible crunch for Ajax programmers. Uh, which is a, a coding language uh, framework, etc. cetera. Um, within three years, Ajax was dead. It was just completely dead. No one was using it anymore, right? And so before the first, I mean, so if, the, if university were to hear that kind of uh, uh, data and were, were to say, oh my God, we've got to go and do a program in Ajax, right? Ajax would, you know, th those students would be unemployable if that's what they've learned. And so I think one of the key things in burning glasses um, is, is, uh, uh, is bringing up uh, some interesting uh, data on this, is really focused less on the particular, uh, you need to know this particular language or this particular uh, piece of knowledge, and much more about mostly evergreen type of skills, right? So this is the famous part of what universities claim to teach, right? Critical thinking and problem solving and things like that and their component parts. Unfortunately, universities don't actually do that. So uh, it, it would be, it'd be behoove institutions to actually think about what are those transferable skills that they can be uh, incorporating into their, uh, into their uh, um, uh, educational systems that are less reactive to a particular state and more among, from a predictive perspective of what, what the market will, will need. Oh, very interesting. Can add some Yes, more? of course. Yeah. So predictive, I, uh, it's another dimension. Prediction usually is uh, used uh, collectively. But it makes much more sense, I believe, if we use the prediction uh, individually. And uh, how we could understand uh, the construction of knowledge. I will use a metaphor. The construction of knowledge is the movement of a uh, student through a series of different conceptual maps. And each one of the conceptual maps that he or she goes from one to another is better and better and better, and by better I mean more uh, concurrent to the collectively, uh, the collectively, the collective idea of the relevant scientific community. So, if we manage to uh, see the correspondence between this series of conceptual maps through which each student is moving at the particular student, then we are going to have a, a, a powerful predictive tool. Uh, is it possible? Okay. Up to now it's not. And this, that is why we have failed to transform the vast amount of educational data into effective teaching practices. And this is what we should uh, uh, find and make sure that uh, we could, we should find the technological tools uh, which will help us to make this transformation. So prediction on an individual rather than collective basis is uh, what makes uh, sense in my view. Thank you. And a last very quick question to Sean. Um, what do you think is the uh, main uh, obstacle for universities at the moment, other than Arizona State University, to embrace technology in their campuses? Is it all about the culture, like you mentioned before? Do you think that would be the main key thing that we and others need to change? Yeah, so that, that would be my default response. But I think, I think another thing to consider is uh, 
the environmental circumstances for which a university exists within. So Arizona State University is a, is a public, state-funded research university in the city of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, that presents a set of environmental complexities uh, relative to who we are and what our place is in, in Arizona in the U.S. So entrepreneurial activities, such as digital education, aligns with both the mission, but was also a catalyst around our, our advancement. So uh, the mission, uh, the culture, and then the environmental circumstances that, that surround the institution, we don't have the same challenges that a lot of the private uh, elite institutions across the, universe, uh, the U.S. have, for example. Um, they don't have some of the challenges we have. And so I think those are contextual uh, things to consider. Uh, that uh, back to the notion of, of design, once you consider those, then you can come up with various strategies uh, to, to advance. By the way, Sean, have the best title ever, Chief Design Officer. Really impressive. I want to thank all the panelists here, and thank you. Keep enjoying the summit. <laughs>